Well, I feel like we've already had a sermon today. Susan took the words right out of my mouth, so I think we're just going to cancel the sermon. Wait, well, never mind. Never mind. Our scripture today comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 33. It was still the first day of the week that evening while the disciples were behind closed doors because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities. Jesus came and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. After this, he, he showed them his hands and his side. When the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. And Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sin, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they aren't forgiven. Thomas, the one called Didymus, one of the twelve, wasn't with the disciples when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. But he replied, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger in the wounds left by the nails, and put my hand into his side, I won't believe. After eight days, his disciples were again in a house, and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus entered and stood among them. He said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into my side. No more disbelief. Believe. Thomas responded to Jesus, My Lord and my God. Jesus replied, Do you believe because you see me? Happy are those who don't see and yet believe. Then Jesus did many other miraculous signs in his disciples' presence, signs that aren't recorded in this scroll. But these things were written so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, God's Son, and that believing you will have life in his name. May God bless the reading of God's word. There was a church not unlike ours, in a community not unlike Kokomo. At one point in the church's history, it was the largest church in the community. Lots of programs of evangelism and outreach, programs that served those in need in the community. But time changed. People moved away. People left the church to go to other churches. But the congregation stayed full of life and vitality, those few who were there. But then the culture started to change. That automatic authority that was once given to the church and to Christianity and religion in general waned. And the congregation felt that loss of automatic authority. And it created anxiety and a sense of loss and fear. And that fear in the congregation led to rifts and divisions. Fear began to rule the congregation. Their many outreach and evangelism programs dried up as volunteers became harder and harder to find. If the church was a castle, the drawbridge was coming up and the gates were coming down. The church began to fear the neighborhood around them, so much so that they started to lock the doors on Sunday morning when worship started for fear that someone new and strange might come in while they're worshiping. The greeters at the fronts of the doors turned from smiling, happy people there to greet to centuries, there to guard and protect the church and the congregation from any outside force. And that's how the church existed for a while, fearful and anxious behind locked doors. The Gospel of John tells us about another set of locked doors and another group of scared, anxious people. 
John says that the disciples, after the crucifixion of Jesus, hid behind these locked doors for fear that the Jewish authorities would come, find them, do what they did to Jesus to them. So they hid. I imagine them nervously pacing back and forth behind the locked doors, unsure of what to do and unsure of who to call for help. For the church in our story, and for the disciples in our text, fear has led to locked doors and death-dealing loads of anxiety. Should they be anxious, though? A couple verses before what we read today, Mary had seen the Lord, and the Lord had said, Go and tell the disciples. Have they forgotten the good news that, that Mary told them, that Jesus was no longer in the grave, but that God had raised him? Perhaps they weren't only anxious and scared, but they were also doubters as well. Like the doubting, scared disciples, the congregation huddled behind their locked doors and wondered if God was going to do something. The pastor and the elders put on a smiling face and proclaimed good news, but their hearts were worried, and they doubted that anything possible was in store, anything positive was possible for their now little church. While the church had closed itself off from the changing world around them, there was still life in the congregation. One congregant said to another over coffee, You know, I'm tired of thinking about our declining numbers, and I'm tired of being scared, and I'm tired of locking doors. What if instead of focusing on our lack, what if we intentionally spent time building community here, between us who are still here? And something changed that day in that little church. A new spirit came in amongst them. It was a spirit of peace. You know, peace is a beautiful thing. It's just what that church needed at that time, and it's just what the disciples needed as well. The peace that comes from the hope of resurrection. Just as the disciples are at their worst, the resurrected Christ appears to them, just as Mary told. The first words he says to them are, Peace be upon you. Imagine the hope that must have sprang back into their souls. The peace of Christ comes. He shows them his scars. And then he says that just as God had sent him into the world, he is now sending them into the world. But not alone. He breathes on them. He breathes the Holy Spirit onto them. See, unlike Luke's gospel, where the resurrection brings a period of time with Jesus, and then it's not till Pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes, in John's gospel, the resurrection and the giving of the Holy Spirit are one and the same. That image of Jesus breathing on the disciples, bringing them back to life, infusing their spirits with that Holy Spirit of God, reminds me of a scene from The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. The scene I'm thinking about has Aslan, that great lion. After he's resurrected, he runs to the witch's castle, and there he finds... Creatures locked in stone, frozen in stone by the witch's evil magic. And so he goes up to these creatures and he breathes onto them. And as he breathes onto them, the stones begin to fall away. Breath comes into their lungs and life returns to them. In the literature of C.S. Lewis, Aslan is Jesus. The one who breathes life into those frozen by evil magic and paralyzing fear. But John's audience didn't have the opportunity to read the Chronicles of Narnia. Hearing the story that John tells, the story of Jesus breathing the Holy Spirit onto the disciples, they would have been reminded of another, more powerful story. The story of the time when God took a clump of soil and breathed into it, creating the first human. 
The Spirit of God that Jesus gives is the Spirit of creation, the Spirit of life. It gives life, it restores life, it sustains life. The Holy Spirit given by the breath of Jesus is an empowering force that will push the church beyond the limits it thought it had. No doors is ever, are ever closed to the Spirit. No person is unredeemable because the Spirit of life is open and available to all. It empowers those scared, fearful disciples to carry on the ministry of Jesus. Even when they're huddled together behind locked doors, Jesus came to them, calling them to carry on his ministry. They were called to be the hands and feet of Jesus. You've probably heard that saying, uh, uh, God doesn't call the equipped, God equips the called. The fact can be seen throughout Scripture, as you see God call the tongue-tied Moses to proclaim to Pharaoh the freedom of God's people, or the time when God called that little no-named shepherd boy to become Israel's greatest king, or that time that God transformed a gospel persecutor into a gospel proclaimer, and Paul... And you even see it in the fact that God came to the earth not as a great king like Caesar, but a little boy in the backwoods town of Nazareth. And now, God has called scared, doubting, anxiety-ridden women and men to continue the ministry of Jesus. Friends, I can think of few things more wonderful, more full of good news, than that God can and will use us in God's service, sometimes even in spite of ourselves. It's that idea, the idea that God can and will use us, that ignited a spark in that little congregation we've been talking about. Once they connected with each other and started building relationships, the Spirit of God began to move. And little by little, the church's heart turned from inward to outward. When the chokehold of anxiety released its grip and the fear of others left them, a fervor for evangelism and outreach erupted. But the neighborhood around the congregation had changed so much. So much that they had to take a hard look and rethink about how they would reach out to the culture around them. One day the elders were talking and one of the elders simply said, let's just start by opening our doors to our neighbors. And so they did. They stepped out in faith and followed the lead of the Spirit. And little by little, the neighbors began to come to church. Eventually, the church was full of people, but they weren't like the crowd that had been there before. This new community looked very different. Young and old, blacks, whites, Asians, and Latinos... All the classes, children, gay men, and lesbians all started coming to this church from the neighborhood. But some of the old crowd were concerned about this new community. You know, I, I find it interesting that after Jesus gave the Holy Spirit to the disciples, he said, now you have the power to forgive sins. Scholars say that John is writing to a community of Christians, of Jesus followers, that had been kicked out of their synagogue. So John wants them to know that the Spirit is at work in them. The Spirit of God is open to them, even the ones who had been outcast and called weirdos. Perhaps John is saying... You know how much it hurt to be kicked out of your community. Don't be like that. You have the power to forgive and welcome and embrace. And welcome all to become part of this crazy group of Jesus-loving outcasts. So little by little, the church 
this little but growing church had to, um, had to decide if this new influx of neighbors was going to be truly welcomed at their church. It was a difficult decision, but they decided that since Jesus had forgiven them, then perhaps they could show kindness and hospitality to others. Besides, they said, the Spirit of God is at work. So they embraced their neighbors as family with open arms. In fact, they got so good at welcoming outcasts and strangers that other churches in the community started to say, oh, that church, they'll take anybody. <laughs> but this community, this church said, yeah, we will. They embraced it. They took it. They made it their slogan. They put it on their banners and hung it on their church. We take anybody. Soon the minister of the congregation was asked not to come to the ministerial meetings anymore. And the church was asked not to participate in the community worship night. And it pains me to tell you that one day the pastor arrived at the church to see lights from fire trucks flashing and smoke billowing up as the church burned to the ground. And the sight was simply unbelievable. Many of us struggle with unbelief, whether it's a tragedy like a church burning down or, or something miraculous like seeing a dead man behind locked doors. We're all familiar with the story of Thomas, how he asked to see the wounds of Jesus before he would believe it was really him. He gets a bad rap for his doubts, but Jesus doesn't scold him. Jesus doesn't send Thomas away. Instead, Jesus takes Thomas and guides him to his hands and his wounds and helps Thomas believe. One of the last things Jesus says to him is do not be unbelieving, but believing. See, Jesus wants Thomas to have an ongoing, open action of being open to possibilities, open to the world, open to others, open to the people you don't like, open to change, open to a belief that things can get better, open to things like resurrection. Thomas shouldn't be looked down on for his doubts. The fact is that Thomas, like many of us, don't know how to believe or what to believe when it comes to these stories of Jesus. Tom should be celebrated because even through his doubts, he stayed committed to the disciples and to the mission of Jesus until faith came to him. There's this old way of thinking about the church. One is the Roman way in which you have to believe a certain amount of things before you really become a part of a community. And then there's the Celtic way, which says you come to the community, you belong, you invest, you fellowship, and then faith comes, belief comes. That is the power of resurrection. After that night, tradition says that Thomas went to India proclaiming the good news of Jesus. And so centuries later, when Western missionaries came with traders to India, they were astounded to find already functioning Christian communities all over the Western coast of India. The resurrection isn't an isolated event, a parlor, trick a parlor trick for mesmerizing the gullible. It's both the powerful overcoming of anxiety, fear, and death, and the beginning of Christian witness. Jesus came to the disciples in their fear, in their doubts, and their anxiety, bringing them peace, mission, and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. What he created that night behind those locked doors was an uprising of belonging for the outcasts and weirdos of the world. It was an uprising of fellowship. Brian McLaren says, Fellowship is the kind of belonging that isn't based on status, achievement, or gender, but is in instead is based on a deep belief that everyone matters, everyone is welcome, and everyone is loved, no exceptions, no conditions. 
It's the kind of belonging you find at the bottom of the ladder, among the rest, with all the other failures and losers who have either climbed the ladder and fallen or never gotten up enough gumption in the first place. Whatever else this uprising will become from the night, from that night, it's been an uprising of fellowship, a community where anyone who wants to be part of us will be welcome. Once the fires were put out and the fire crews were gone, the pastor and the congregation of that little but growing and welcoming church met around a small table with a loaf of bread and a cup of wine. And the pastor raised her head and said, we don't have much, but neither do we need much. Because long ago, Jesus breathed upon his disciples and commissioned them to continue his ministry of peace, forgiveness, and welcome to the world. We have the bread. We have the wine. We have one another. What more do we need? The Spirit of God is still moving, still leading us deeper into fellowship with each other and the world, and that is the hope of resurrection. Amen. <laughs>